Hi everyone, welcome to this month's uh, Coach Developer Conference Call. I'm Sam Cowan, your host, and uh, our my guest this week is Travis Dorse, who's a PhD at Utah State University. And I'm going to come back and introduce Travis in a moment. But uh, if you're a if you're a regular caller here, you know I have these announcements that I I promote every call. Uh, first of all, if you're new, all of our past calls are available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and also Google Play. And if you search for Coach Educator, you should come across it. Uh, if not, you can certainly um, shoot me an email, and I realize I just didn't put my email address up there. Uh, and I can give you the link to that. Uh, if you do, go, do uh, go to those sites, please subscribe and leave a review. It really kind of helps other people follow how, how iTunes or Apple Podcasts works. The more reviews you have, the higher you go up the search function. And just a reminder, I'll have you know this already, but the U.S. Center for Coaching Excellence Coach Developer Conference will be in Colorado Springs in 2019. Still waiting to finalize dates on that, uh, but June is – I can say June at this point in time. Uh, upcoming conference calls, I usually have these scheduled out. I'm working on one for October, and uh, hopefully it will be really good if, the, if my uh, person comes through for me. If not, if you have suggestions, I'm wide open for uh, for topics or for individuals. And if you want to have a if you need a chat uh, during it, or you have a question that you want to ask during it, if you go up to this little bubble, if you're logged in, uh, you can click on that and chat. If you have dialed in, I will tell you how to do the Q and A uh, when we go to that part afterwards. And that's right now. So if you are listening live here, if you when it comes time for the Q&A session, if you do star six, you'll be placed in the queue, and then one will uh, bring you on board, and you can ask Travis questions. So with that, uh, it's great to have Travis uh, Dorse here, who is a Ph.D. at Utah State University. He has a Ph.D. in sport and exercise psychology from Purdue University, where he also did his master's in undergrad work. Um, and and in addition to that, he was a, a consensus All-American punter at Purdue in 2001. And I'm going to go ahead and say something that uh, I'm a University of Georgia alum, and uh -huh. one of the great comebacks in college football history from my side, fortunately, was my team came out on top of that. But that was uh, uh, one, of my, one of my most memorable games I've ever watched. Um, you may have a very different perspective on that, I understand. Um, Travis was also a multi-sport kid, uh, and he was also an NFL punter for both the uh, Cincinnati Bengals and the Green Bay Packers. And he currently is uh, at Utah State University. He's the founding director of the Families and Sport Lab in the Department of Human Development, and he teaches numerous undergraduate courses on lifespan development. And his research really focuses on the role of youth sport participation, and obviously that falls perfectly in line with what this group is, is about. So, uh, Travis, uh, welcome to the group. Sam, thanks for having me. You know, it's never it's never good practice to start by uh, by bringing up old memories like that. I tell you what, <laughs> you know, I, I need to work on that part of my game for sure. Yes, um, fantastic. Uh, how about let's start back? I mentioned in the intro here, and I've, I you know I did a little bit of prep for this. Uh, you were a multi sport kid. Tell me about your your experiences in youth sports growing up. Yeah, I tell you what, I feel a, a bit like a dinosaur. I don't know that we have a lot of these running around anymore for various reasons, which we'll probably get into later. But, um, yeah, growing up, soccer, basketball, baseball, uh, kind of added football to the mix in, in middle school, uh, track and field to the mix in high school. So really, you know, like I caught a lot of kids that grew up in the 80s and 90s just did everything. And I remember, you know, parents running me around 200, 300 miles around San Diego County. Uh, as a youngster, and then later we we moved to Montana. And actually, you know, interestingly enough, one of the reasons we we made the move to Montana, which is where my mom was originally from, uh, was because of this sort of early idea that specialization was important. Um, you know, I, I recall when I was 10, 11 years old, already having the high school coaches, you know, at the high school that I would have attended in San Diego kind of in my ear, hey, you know, quit those other sports, play mine year-round, and we'll make sure you get that college scholarship. And this was, you know, this was right around 1990. And, um, you know, that's I think that's more commonplace today. But in big-time programs, in big-time cities where sports mean a lot, you know, that's that's the nature of the beast. And uh, in moving to Montana, you know, I was able to uh, maintain my, my status sort of as a, a bigger fish in a smaller pond, so to speak, you know, continue to 
to play all those sports, four sports in high school, uh, and I actually was fortunate enough to play even a couple sports in college at Purdue. So, you know, as we look at the data today, uh, the, the path to elite participation is, is definitely not choosing a sport early. It's typically the multi-sport participation and then kind of settling in, you know, post-puberty as you're 14, 15, 16 years old, kind of figuring out what you love and what you're good at. Well, I, I will say you are likely preaching to the choir uh, amongst the audience that uh, it, this is aimed at. So you, you probably got a lot of people going, yes, I'm so glad to hear somebody else say that. Um, I, I found it interesting to talk about the move from San Diego, Montana. And, I know, you know, John Cote has done a little bit of work on where are professional athletes coming from, and it's much yeah. more moved towards that smaller town or smallish town versus San Diego, which is, you know, obviously huge. Um, maybe yeah, elaborate a little my, bit on that. Yeah, absolutely. This is not, you know, necessarily my line of research, but as you mentioned, uh, Jean Cote and some of his colleagues, uh, specifically, I think, Kent have been looking at it, mostly to uh, hockey players and, and NHL players. Uh, I think also some recently with NFL. But what they're finding is that it's sort of these these middle-sized towns, right? It's not the small sort of, you know, rural um, off the map, and it's also not these big metropolises. But it's the it's the towns that are big enough. Uh, I think they say 100 to about 250,000 inhabitants. Yeah. Big enough to have all the resources, but also small enough that there there aren't these you know huge pressures and being drawn you know in so many different directions. So so yeah, I think you know you think about sort of suburban America, and these are the places where where our, our professional athletes are, are coming from. Yeah, and you know I, I'm I'm a bit older than you, and I can remember you know so many cases it seemed like that the kids who were going into you know professional sports came from. You know, kind of, lot, and a lot of it was basketball that I was following at the time. So a lot of it was like inner city poor kids and stuff. And now we've even seen that shift where it's much more of it's a middle class thing now to to do that. You seems like you hear fewer and fewer of those stories of kids either from super small towns like you know on the French Lick, Indiana comes to mind. Right. Um, right. Yeah, you know, big Larry Bird fan. What can I say? And then you know, and or the inner city of of Harlem, where guys you know like uh, Stephon Marbury and uh, Kenny Anderson came from. Telling you, we're dating myself here on on my uh, on on myself. Um, and so it, it's it's changed a lot in that area. Um, yeah, the, the social structure around youth sport is is definitely changing. And I, I wanted to throw a caveat into what I said for it. earlier in that you know the path the path to elite participation is is typically not single sport specialization early on but there are and i recognize this maybe particularly with this audience there are you know some sports uh specifically sports where young athletes peak earlier i'm thinking yeah. about figure skating and gymnastics right these are sports where you know if you're going to peak when you're 16 to 18 years old then, then yes you do need to sort of find that love that passion that ability early on uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't be complementing that participation with with other things Right, yeah, absolutely, and, and especially the women's gymnastics side of it. You're right. They, uh, uh, you know, that's when you look at the Olympics. They're all uh, to really very young, even though the Olympics have moved that age up a little bit to try to, you know, help out a little bit with that. Um, you know, we, we talk about early specialization, but you know, one of the things that in doing a little bit of research, and I, my primary job is working at USA Fencing, and you know, one of the things that has come up in this is. But having early exposure to some sports to try to hit those supposed areas where you're really trying to, you know, that, you know, we have this idea that there are these periods in life where you're highly, I don't know, trainable, I guess, or susceptible yep. or open to things. And that's one of the things that I find interesting is that you don't have to necessarily specialize, but being exposed to things at early ages as well. And I, I don't know if that's an area you've looked at or not. Again, we no, you're, you're absolutely your, right. Your area. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and I think, you know, you think about it also in terms of something like language development, right? They talk about these critical windows, you know, from maybe four to eight years old, and I think there are similar windows um, physically. And the nice thing about it, as you mentioned, you don't have to specialize. You, you just expose kids to different options and different things and see what they learn to love and see what their body grows into, but, but then they can come back to it, you know, at a serious level when they're, you know, eight, 10, 12, 14 years old, and, and it's almost like they never left. There's also... Uh, you know, something in the motor learning and motor development literature that, that speaks to this idea of, of transfer, skill transfer, right? So someone who's out there playing soccer, 
right, is becoming a better tennis player via learning things like footwork, right? And I think a couple of great right. examples are Roger Federer, Rafa Nadal, both great soccer players growing up who've transitioned now, obviously, into all-time great tennis players and, and largely because of their footwork. Uh, and I, I think there are examples in all kinds of uh, of other sports, and I can lean on some of the lessons that I learned, you know, in one sport and, and took it to another. And, and some of those lessons were physical, others were sort of socio-emotional, dealing with coaches, dealing with teammates, you know, learning how to deal with failure, all those types of things that transfer across contexts. Yeah, yeah you mentioned the the soccer one. There's I, I, I three names come to mind off the top of my head when I hear that: Steve Nash, Kobe Bryant, and Andrew Luck. All talk about go. their how soccer influenced them, and of course. Um, you know, Kobe grew up overseas, and and so was his soccer. As did Andrew Luck, also. Um, and then um, Nash sounds like he just played soccer because it's something a lot of kids do. On that, yeah, very good. Um, and, and and how many athletes do we see? You know, that that come to football, maybe as tight ends in particular, from the game of basketball because they have great yeah. footwork, because they have great hands, because they can use their body in space. I mean, these are these are skills that you just learn as an athlete in all kinds of contexts. So yeah, I, I don't think we need to beat the horse to death here, but I, I, you know, <laughs> I think there's a lot that can be gained in particular from playing a lot of sports early on during that window that you talked about. Uh, well, swing back around to some areas that you probably have done some research on, and and maybe just. Uh, talk about how you have seen the youth sports change from when you were a kid uh, to now both, you know, your own experience as well as the research and, you know, trying to look back and go, oh, was that the way it was when, you know, in, in the late 90s when you were playing high school sports and stuff? And so talk about some yeah. of the changes that you've seen over that time. Sure. So, so my lab and I have sort of termed this trickle-down professionalization. All right, and it's this idea that you know we're all we're each level now from youth through sort of adolescent up through high school and even college are becoming more professional like in the way that they approach youth sports. I mean, I see today um, young people as early as six years old that have off-season trainers that have private strength coaches that that work with sports psychologists, um, and this, by all accounts, is is sort of treating these youngsters as a professional, treating it as their job, treating it as something where only the the final outcome matters. And that's different. You know, back to your question about what was different when I played. I, there was none of that. We, you know, there were structured sport opportunities, sure. I mean, I remember playing AAU basketball and traveling around the country and going to camps, you know, baseball camps at Nebraska and, and football camps uh, in Florida and just across the country and things. But But it wasn't like this um, be all end all. I have to do this year round, and I have to, you know, focus all of my downtime and energy on getting better at this sport. You know, and when it, when football season was over, you know, I moved on to basketball in the winter, and when basketball season was over, it was on to baseball in the spring. And 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 mixed in with all that, there were just opportunities to to learn and grow and and, and pick up a tennis racket and try that. Even though I never played, you know, tennis uh, to go to the pool and swim. Even though I never was a competitive swimmer and just do all of these things and move my body and learn. Uh, learn to love to move my body. And I think that's perhaps, you know, in the field of kinesiology at least, that's sort of the, the thing that connects us all is how do we get people to want to move their bodies? And and I think if we think historically about youth sport, that's the reason we get our kids involved, right, to teach them uh, to love to move their bodies, to be physically active, to be healthy later in life. It's not, you know, we don't put them in thinking, okay, my kid's going to become an Olympian, my kid's going to become a pro. So I think there are there are adults around the country, and I'm not going to throw everybody into this into this um, box, but I think there are some adults who only think about, you know, the achievement side, the achievement outcomes that go along with sport, and not about sort of the, the process of sport and the, the great benefits that can come from participation. And, you know, what what do you what's your research showing in terms of that that effect when the parents are so focused on that outcome, and yeah. and so focused on either. You know, I I think the the chasing the college scholarship right now is this thing, and I I see it in fencing, and I'll I'll kind of come back to that um, as well. But what's the effect of the kids on that when they're ten or twelve years old, when mom and or dad are 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 putting that pressure on them? Yeah, well, you teed this one up really nicely, and I'm not sure if you if you <laughs> read this bit of our research or or if you're just sort of speaking in generalities here, but but you led me into this study that we conducted in 2016 some colleagues and I were really interested yeah 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 I mean we were really interested in in this idea of what effect is money having on um, both parent involvement but then also on the downstream effects for the kids in, in sport and what we found is really interesting I mean we went we went into this you know sort of with this naive 
caricature of the American family whereby, you know, the kids, the rich kids are going to have the better experiences, right? The parents who can spend the money are going to have kids who have better coaches, better off-season trainers. They can go to camps and travel for tournaments and they wear better equipment, right? So, you know, what could possibly go wrong, right? They have all of these, all of these opportunities in sport. So we thought, yeah, by nature of that, they're going to have better experiences and a better chance at success. And when we actually collected our data and looked at it across our, our national sample, what we found was kind of the exact opposite, which really surprised us. And that was families who were spending more um, on their kids' youth sport participation, the children themselves actually perceived more pressure. Now, that could have been that could be real pressure. It can be just perceived on the part of the child. It, it mm-hmm. didn't necessarily even matter what the parents were doing objectively, but but the kids felt more pressure in those families where they were spending more money. And as a result of that pressure, as you might imagine, they they enjoyed their sport experience less, and they were also less motivated to continue playing in future seasons. So, kind of the kind of the whole of that uh, sequence of variables that I just described is that families who are spending more have kids who actually enjoy sport less and don't want to play in future seasons, which, which seems to be sort of counterintuitive and the opposite of what, what parents would want. Right. Um, now, now, the interesting thing here is that statistically speaking, at least when we, when we took the, the perception of parent pressure out of that model, everything else fell apart. So said differently, it wasn't about the spending, right? It was about how parents interacted with their kids as a result of that spending. And you can imagine, let me, let me throw kind of an analogy at you. You can imagine that when, when you know, when you, when you throw five or $10,000 at, at your investment team, right, you want them to turn that into something more, <laughs> right? You're investing it because you want something more. Youth sports today as an investment, right? I'm putting, I'm putting 10,000 in for your basketball participation, travel, you know, travel team this year. We're going to tournaments, camps, coaches, all this. What am I going to get out of that, right? Are you going to be um, a starter? Are you going to earn a varsity letter? Are you going to go on and get a college scholarship? As you mentioned, chasing that scholarship, are you going to get to the NBA, right? What is my return? What's my ROI as a parent on this investment in you as a young athlete? And I, you know, I encourage parents all the time to not think about the investment as showing return in all of those sort of tangible, measurable things, but in showing return in your in your child's development and experience and also yours as a parent i mean you're going to go through this journey with them so what is your experience like is this something that's strengthening your family that's teaching your child skills that will carry over someday to their job and to their own family right so what are what are the things that we value i guess is what i'm what i'm really boiling this down to what are the things we value as a result of sport well yeah and i i think there's just there's that subtle pressure on it and I, I'll, I'll share you know, my experience was not in sport, but my my family didn't have a lot of money growing up, and I went to I went to a private high school that I I, I found out later that wow it was pretty expensive, and mm-hmm. but I do remember suddenly feeling some pressure to make good grades right. because my parents were spending you know a, a chunk of money that. You know, I still don't know. My, my sister and I talk about this all the time. We don't know where the money came from, and every now and then I go, God, were they doing something illegal or what to pay for this? <laughs> and uh, but I did feel that pressure to make really good grades and succeed and 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 do that. So I I can imagine that yeah, if it's very, I mean, it's it's more overt with sports sometimes. If you're paying the trainer and the club fees, and um, you know, I think kids are probably aware of that too. That it's got to play a role uh, with them in some way. Um, on a big one, and you know this kind of leads into another one. Uh, I, I watched your TEDx talk from uh, March of 2018, and you uh, you referenced Dan Ariely's work, and I'm a huge Dan Ariely fan. By the way, he's a behavioral eco- economics person for those of you who don't know. Um, and you talked about his work on motivation, and you even applied it to yourself, going from as a kid to an NFL player. Do you maybe? Talk about that. I think that plays a little bit into this uh, whole idea of of this pressure and how it changes folks in motivation. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, you know, I think, you know, when we when we think about through a, through a regular everyday lens, when we think about if we're already motivated to do something, and we add a reward to that, like money, right? So think about your kid, right? If your kid loves mowing the lawn, and you, and and you say, well, you know what? Let's make this one of your chores. We're going to pay you five dollars to mow the lawn. We think that that should actually enhance their motivation, right? Because they already loved it, and now we're giving them something they are they love also money, right? 
um, so they should love it more. It's kind of this this positive times a positive should equal a bigger positive. But what's interesting is that you know motivation doesn't actually you know it, it's not actually bound by these regular laws of sort of what we think about uh, arithmetic, right? It's it's motivation is unique in that when we pair something that we already love that we already have an intrinsic love to do with a reward with an investment we see our motivation typically go down. And that's kind of the, the counterintuitive piece. You know, you mentioned the behavioral economics side of it. And, and the cool thing about behavioral economics is oftentimes we as humans do things that are counterintuitive for odd reasons. And this, is one, this is one of those cases. And yeah, in my TED talk, I reflected upon this from, from a personal perspective. And I, you know, I shared a story that, you know, as a young, as a young child, just back in San Diego, again, you know, we're, we're playing, playing football on the playground at recess and like a lot of kids do whether it's football or soccer or whatever you know whatever kids play and you know this was the kind of kind of recess where when the aides were watching it was it was two-hand touch and when they weren't it was a little a little heavier than that but we were out there playing football you know having fun and um and i remember some conversations with my uh with my classmates many of whom went on to play either college football or college uh, basketball or baseball or whatever it might be i mean we, we had some good athletes in, in my class and i remember having conversations with them thinking like wow these guys actually get paid to do this this is so fun we just come out here and play and we're smiling and having fun and competing and getting into each other's grill you know and and can you imagine we could get paid for this right and and we kind of left it there thinking well yeah that's it's kind of a pipe dream nobody's going to go on and play in the nfl but then I find myself in my mid twenties with that exact opportunity, and and I recall, you know, sitting at home, you know, six figure salary going into my bank account, just depressed and thinking, you know, man, they're they're not paying me enough to do this for <laughs> for for a, for a living, right? And it, it was just a very different feeling than playing for fun for free on the playground at recess to when it becomes a job, to when we pair that reward, that investment, that salary with something that I should have and did inherently love, which was, you know, competing and playing sports. Um, but I'm just sitting there thinking, wow, this is, this is more of a burden than anything. And um, that's unfortunate. And, and I get it that professional sport, I mean, that's not going to go away in professional sports, but, but why should we be subjecting our, our high school and our adolescent and our youth um, to, to that in the lower ranks of sports as they're just trying to develop that passion and just trying to learn new skills and, and kind of find their way. There's no reason that we should be putting so much pressure on them, right? That, that kids, like you said, shouldn't be coming home and trying to figure out where are mom and dad getting this money and what are they <laughs> expecting in return for this investment, right? Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot, there's a lot to that when we can apply this, uh, behavioral economics lens to a lot of our sport research. And I think it's something we haven't been doing. I think it's a, it's a cool trend in our field now. Uh, it's, it's something we should, we should continue to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, lo I love the behavioral economics stuff. I've really gotten into reading Kahneman and Tversky and, um, and yep. Ariely. And Ariely brings such a fun way of looking at it too, that if, if folks haven't seen some of his TED talks, they are, they're, they're, you know, they're witty, they're funny, and they also, you know, share a lot of good information. There's my plug for, for Dan Ariely. Um, there you go. You know, it, it's funny. You mentioned early on that you, at, at the uh, Families and Sport Lab at Utah State, you guys refer to as the trickle-down professionalization. I've, I've referred to this as the adultification of youth sports. Um, Absolutely. Partly because it has that, it has that kind of, you know, it, it connotes something that's going on there in my mind anyway. Um, yeah. and, and we, we're seeing that a lot now. And I mentioned earlier that we, uh, we have a little working group of, on parent engagement that some of the NGBs are involved in along with, uh, along with Chris Snyder from the U.S. Olympic Committee as well. And, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, and I was a trainer for Positive Coaching Alliance for a couple of years as well, and I would do parent talks at high schools. And, you know, one of the parents one day after doing this was, you know, said something effective, you know, we're not the parents you need to be talking to. Right. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's so true. You know, the people who came to that are the people who probably already get it. And, and partly I wonder then why'd you come, you know, because you already are doing this, but yet I do that too. So I kind of understand that. But, but how do we reach, how do we reach parents to get this message to them that, you know, look, Putting all this pressure on your kid is not going to get them where you want them to go, and maybe where they want to go either. Um, you know, yeah. how do we how do we get those behaviors to change? How do we how to reach out and get to the parents that really um, don't get it, if you will, um, and 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 
pull that around so that it's a little different. So we don't have YouTube videos of parents at the under 10 softball match getting into, you know, fights in the stands and uh, right. and whatnot, which just happened a few months ago, as probably a lot of people sure. know. So anyway, long-winded is, question uh, on how do we how do we reach those parents? Well, I mean, if I there's no silver bullet. If I had the answer, I, I surely wouldn't be a professor. I'd be making more money doing something else. But, <laughs> um, you know, I think this is this is an oil tanker, right? And we're we're trying to turn this bad boy around in in choppy seas, and that doesn't that doesn't happen with one turn of the wheel. I mean, this is this is a slow this is a slow maneuver we're trying to pull off. And I think the key is that we look at this um, sort of from a two lens perspective, and that is I think we need to have the grassroots. We need to have a movement among parents that hey, this this is not okay. This is not how youth sport was intended to be designed. This is not how we want to be involved in youth sport, and we demand a change, right? And and when there's when there's a critical mass of parents that feel that way, then some movement can start to happen at the grassroots level. But simultaneously, we also need sort of a top-down approach. And, and uh, incidentally, neither of these will work in isolation. They need to happen, you know, simultaneously. Right. But we need we need people like you with national governing bodies, and people like me that are doing the research, and people like a Tom Ferry at the Aspen Institute, who's in private industry. You know, we need this sort of top-down, like, hey. Here's what we know. Here is what the evidence says. Here's how we can be better. Here are some tips and tools and strategies that might inform that grassroots movement. So it's, it sort of becomes like this sandwich where we're squeezing out, right? If, if you have, uh, have a jelly sandwich, right, or a Nutella mm. crepe and you squeeze it, all that <laughs> stuff's going to come out of the middle. And, and that's kind of how I, I look at this. We need to apply pressure, good pressure from the top and the bottom um, to really change how we envision youth sports happening in America. Now, we're never going to get rid of this pyramid where our goal is is to get is to find the best of the best, right? And and those are the people that are going to compete for you and for for other, you know, Olympic sports and for college and professional sports, right? We're mm-hmm. we're never going to get rid of that search to find the best. But what we need to do is also consider how we can provide structured, um, evidence-based, and quality opportunities for those that kind of get left out or left behind of that, right? So for the 12-year-old that's, that's not good enough to go play travel soccer, what are the rec opportunities? What are the, the interscholastic or intrascholastic opportunities for, for that youngster? Um, for the 16-year-old that maybe wants to try a new sport but realizes that, hey, all of my, all of my cohorts have been doing this for 13 years. I'm way behind. Well, how does that person find an, an insertion point into into sport? I think there are a lot of cool questions that we need to be asking and finding answers for that surround sport that isn't this sort of traditional put your kid in, get him to 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, turn him into an expert, and find him, you know, the competitive opportunity. Yeah. I, yeah, you, you've hit on a lot of things. I, you know, again, I, there is a there is a segment of, of the Olympic world where it is about medals and doing that thing, but I think a lot of us also realize that, that it's good to have those kids stick around in the sport and and for some sports, I think it is easier. Uh, I, you know, I think of sports like fencing, golf, tennis, some others where, you know, yeah, they're, they're, you can get cut in high school from the team doing that, but at least fencing doesn't have a big high school presence, so probably not a good example on that one. But but it's not one of those – I mean, we have fencing tournaments that as long as you pay your fee, you can keep doing it. You You don't have to be on a team to do that. So sometimes the individual sports may be – more open to that and having a lifelong path versus, um, you know, versus some of the team sport things where it gets a little trickier and kids get cut. Because I, I think all of us, even in the high performance world, look at this and go, yeah, we really do need those kids to, to stick well, around because and, they also yeah. become referees and coaches and right. administrators and uh, volunteers and things. And so they're an important yeah. component in, in that pinnacle at the top. Yeah, yeah, and Sorry, I think you're, just, you're, you're winnowing. No, you're good. You're, you're you're just winnowing the field too early, especially in small sports mm-hmm. like fencing, like yeah, um, like alpine skiing. I was talking to one of your colleagues, John Casson, uh, oh, up in Park yes. City. I don't know if you know John. I yeah, know him well. And, and John and I, perfect. Yeah, so he just uh, moved up to Canada. They they stole him, man. But uh, trader. Yes, <laughs> I know. But uh, you know he's back. He's back on the slopes. He's back doing what he loves. But he yeah. formerly in his former life down here in Park City was in charge of, of a lot of the U.S. Uh, ski and snowboards coaching ed stuff, as you know. Mm-hmm. 
And I was talking to him about this very question, and he shared an example of uh, Bodie Miller and how, how Bodie, as a youngster, was somebody that nobody projected as becoming an elite skier. He, he wasn't there physically. He wasn't there mentally. And it took him until his sort of mid, even to late teens, yeah. to become the kind of athlete that they knew, you know, was inside of him, but he just wasn't demonstrating that at the, at the youth ages. So, you know, yeah, he, he could have been a casualty of getting cut from their developmental squad, you know, at 12, 13, 14, and they could have just written him off and said, you know what, this guy's never going to develop. He's not mature enough. He doesn't put the time in. And, and he could have been gone and out of the, out of the game. Uh, but instead, you know, they stuck with him, uh, and, and he obviously produced as an Olympian uh, multiple times. So yeah. I hate, I hate, I hate, and that's a strong word, but when, when we cut 12-year-olds who haven't yeah. yet even hit puberty, who haven't <laughs> yet grown into their, their bodies, their minds, their emotions, um, it, it, I struggle with that. And I struggle with telling that kid you're not good enough anymore when – we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know at 18, at 24, at 30, how that how that young athlete is going to turn into, you know, an, a young adult athlete. And and I think it's sometimes I think that's also subtle that maybe they're not cut, but the coach just it doesn't give them the attention in practice and help them develop those skills that one day they right. may grow into. I I, right. I I think about David Robinson and again yep. dating myself here. You know, he he had this late in life growth spurt where he grew to be really tall. But so he learned a lot of skills that you normally associate with, you know, maybe a, a guard or a small forward, which is one of the reasons that he could play as well as he could play because, you know, again, he was good enough at that point that coaches were paying attention to him. But he developed those well-rounded skills. Well, you know, you got a 12-year-old who coach isn't giving them attention. It's just not fun anymore. I'm not learning anything, and so I quit. I, I walk away. It's almost like a soft cut in a way than a. You didn't make the top 15 and, you know, go your own way. So I think there's sometimes some subtlety in that as well. And, and, and I think – I don't know that that's intended. I don't know coaches have that in their mind. I think the, the natural thing, unfortunately, our coaches at youth sports are not, are not well trained for the most part. And that's, you know, that's on us in my profession that we haven't done a good job of that. And, um, and I think reaching out and getting people to understand that – you know, especially in some sports, I, I also come from the cycling world as well, where, you know, it's an endurance sport, 95%, and, you know, that's a late developing sport. Yep. And you've got the yep. scrawny little 12-year-old who finishes, you know, 15th in the race, might just be the kid who ends up winning a stage at the, you know, at the at the Vuelta or, uh, at the, you know, at the Giro d'Italia, which is actually kind of the path that – a recent stage winner followed was he was the scrawny yeah. twelve year old who went under yeah. that. So yeah, my my rant well, on and, that. Just as an aside, Tim Duncan very likely had he not had that growth spurt would have become right. an Olympic swimmer. So yeah. you, know, <laughs> you never you never know. He could have been the first Michael Phelps. Um yeah. and, and you're right. You're absolutely right about the development of skills and the opportunities. Um this is sort of that that what we call in, in science it speaks sort of this gene environment transaction where, you know, your, your genes give you your bod bodily potentialities and then you find an environment and, and that environment and your genes sort of have this transaction as you develop an ability. And when we tell people you're not, you don't have access to this environment anymore, then that gets cut off immediately, right? So I think it's really important that we, we give all types of kids with all types of abilities um, access to environments through which they can develop. Very good. Very good. Well, um, Travis, uh, any other work that you want to share out of out of your uh, your lab there at Utah State? Um, some things yeah, you, know, that one, you guys one, are working on. Sure. One, you know, one piece that I don't often get to talk about, but I think is really important. Um, is well, here's your chance. Go for it. Okay. There you go. Is this? You know, we have we have some work that came out in in 2015 looking at um, children's and parents' perception of parent pressure. And what we found in that was that there's an extreme dissonance between how kids and parents define and, and determine pressure and support. And oftentimes there might be some objective behavior where a parent does something and, and they themselves define this as, oh, hey, I'm being super supportive, right? Hey, you know, I gave my kid $10,000 for this, this experience in youth basketball. I, you know, I'm driving them all around the country. You know, I, I, I hired him a private coach. I talked to him all the time about it. Like I'm being super supportive as a parent, right? But you ask the kid about those very same behaviors and how that impacts the child, and it's it's very much on the side of the coin of, of pressure. 
So, you know, one thing that we encourage when we talk to parents all the time is don't look at this through your adult lens. You called it the adultification of sport, right? Don't look at sport through your adult lens, but instead try and sort of do a 180 and think about how is my child perceiving my involvement? How are they perceiving their experience? How are they perceiving uh, the coach? Um, you know, and, and, and really get to know their goals, the child's goals, really get to understand how I as a parent can help facilitate those goals rather than mine, which might be very different. And I think, you know, when those, I, I've seen in families where those conversations take place, even if with a teenager, sometimes those conversations can be awkward, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the families where those conversations take place, family members are typically on the same page and, and they get one another. There isn't this sort of conflict about, you know, who, who knew what and when and what are we striving to do here, but rather we're all sort of pulling the rope in the same direction. Yeah. That, yeah, that, that's good stuff. I, I'm, I, I'm fascinated by what your lab is doing there, and I'm, I'm glad I, I stumbled across it. And I wish I could kind of figure out how I stumbled across it. I think I was a paper that I came across, and then I got it off a of research gate or something like that, and, um, and it led me to you know, doing a little bit of digging in there and, and pulling up some stuff that you guys have done. So I'm, I'm glad that you guys are doing the good work on this and getting us some good data on this rather than – I think too often, and I don't. I mean, I come a little bit from the research world. My background is exophysiology, and yep. I've kind of transitioned into reading more papers about, uh, you know, social psychology. I have a undergrad in, in psych, much like you, and um, and, and, and trying to transition that to look at what what is the data out there versus our anecdotes sometimes that that are are by are, I think are colored by the extremes of situations. I mean. I, I, I won't say I, you know, probably, you know, the, the percentage of parents who are really kind of, you know, going the Todd Marinovich dad route are, are really, really small. And then I think there's a big group of parents out there who, who mean, and I think they all mean well, but could be doing this in a different way, but sometimes it'd be counterproductive. Like you said, it's the, it's the paying the kid to cut the grass when he already loves to cut the grass isn't really going to help and may end up not like him not liking to cut the grass anymore uh, in that. And I think yeah. that, that part, I think if we can get across to parents might help some of this as well of, of kind of dialing back uh, some of this pressure that's being put on the kids or the kids are feeling like it. Like you said, it, the I, I, parents may not be intentionally putting it on there, but the kids may be perceiving that and getting that cleared up could be a really good thing. So fantastic. So, well, let me open this up to see if uh, anybody has any questions. So every time we go into Q&A there we go. And so, uh, Ken, uh, Ted, if you guys have any questions, just uh, like I said, hit star six uh, since you guys have called in, I think. Although, if you're on the screen here, you can uh, pop into the Q&A mode and uh, give folks a moment or two to think about that um, with it. So, while I give folks a chance here, uh, Travis, uh, what are you guys uh, looking at in terms of research right now? What projects do you have going there? And, um, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for some of the NGBs here to partner with you guys and to, and to work and figure out a way to get this out of the ivory tower um, into the real world. Oh. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Travis, I had you muted there for a minute. It's okay. My yeah. wife does that to me all the time. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, one of the things we've been working on is uh, some work with uh, the USSC crew up in, up in Park City and their Olympic Legacy Foundation and trying to better understand the impact of the 2002 Olympics on what's a pretty small town up there in Park City, about 10,000 yeah. 10, permanent uh, inhabitants. And we're, we're really trying to better understand – you know, what does it mean to a small town like that to have, you know, Olympians running around the supermarket and, and training on the ski slopes and, and just, you know, what, what is the downstream effect of that on the youth sport community? Um, so we've been, we've been working with their uh, governing bodies with U.S. Ski and Snowboard and some of the other, you know, key st stakeholders and gatekeepers there in the community uh, to try and really better understand the impact of that. Um, you know, you mentioned some of the NGBs uh, folks that may be listening here today. You know, we're really interested in – this sort of, as, as we talked about it, this trickle down from, from the top, from professional sports, from college sports, from Olympic sports, and how that can have a positive impact uh, on, our, on our 
on our youth in our country. So that's one direction I think that we see ourselves heading um, in the future. We hope to follow up with the crew in Park City with, with another uh, follow-up research contract to do more work with them. I know they have a number of questions, as, as all of us do in the research world. Another direction we're, we're currently pursuing right now is a colleague of mine at Harvard and I are working with the NCAA. Uh, we've created a, uh, a website for uh, parents of NCAA student-athletes uh, whereby they can go on and learn about best practices for their involvement with their student-athletes academically, athletically, uh, in providing sport and contact uh, for their, for their student-athletes, and that's at um, ncaaparenteducation.com. Uh, you can find that website. Uh, we've also been doing a lot just in the basic sort of youth sport world, kind of recreational slash travel elite youth sport, uh, creating parent education modules. A lot of that we're trying to uh, to get online right now so parents can have those online resources that, that match what we're doing with the Olympic bodies and with the NCAA. So we're really trying to hit this um, kind of from multiple angles uh, yeah. in an evidence-based way. And I think, you know, we're – I'm still – relatively young in my career and, and we see a lot of work in front of us which is which is uh rewarding i mean i think there are a lot of questions out there that need to be answered and we're always looking for community partners and ngb partners to come to us with questions that they have um, that we can help them answer so yeah i think there's no no shortage of work that needs to be done or knowledge that, that can be gained yeah fantastic all right well i don't have anybody in the in the question queue here so uh with that i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap up and uh, Travis, thanks for your time this morning. This has been great. I love the fact that somebody's out there actually gathering data on on the uh, parent engagement and parent role, and and you know the more that we can learn and figure out this and figure out good quanti- you know good ways that we can uh, approach this and quantify our effect. I think is is good. From again pulling my little researcher hat on from the old days in. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Great. All right. So thanks, and thanks, everybody, for joining us this morning, and I uh, hope you guys got a lot out of this. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, sign off now. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.